Today in this curated podcast, we're discussing Ruffer and their differentiated investment approach. And it's timely as Ruffer have made the statement they believe positive absolute returns will not be achievable for most investors in the coming market cycle. And I'm in their London offices with Matt Smith, Partner Investment Director, and the Lead Fund Manager on the Ruffer Total Return Fund and the Ruffer Absolute Master Fund. And I hope today we can structure the conversation along the following lines. An introduction to Ruffer and its evolution since being founded in 94. The investment engine and how it operates. The investment climate and why a new regime may be upon us with potential ugly consequences. And finally, the tools you deploy in managing money and why you feel rougher can withstand the heavy seas surrounding us. So Matt, welcome to this edition of the Money Maze podcast. Thanks, Simon. Great to be here. Well, I've known Rafa for over 30 years. Um, and when I was uh, um, on the Great Ormond Street Hospital Investment Committee, we allocated to you and my partner, Will Campion, did exactly the same when he was at ch- the charity Child Bereavement. But that was quite a long time ago. So maybe we can start with setting the scene. Assets, offices, people, purpose. Just give me a, a sense of Ruffer today. Yeah, sure. So Ruffer was set up in 1994 by Jonathan Ruffer with uh, one purpose, to deliver better investment outcomes for clients who he felt weren't being served terribly well by the industry at that point, um, specifically around relative returns. What he said was the appeal of uh, an investment manager who came to you with a market down 30 and said, you know, you're welcome for the fantastic job I've done. We're only down 20. So he set up the business with a focus on absolute return and capital preservation. Now, uh, as it happens over the cycle that we've been through since, since he set the business up, uh, for major bear markets in that time, we've managed to deliver positive returns in all four of those bear markets um, by avoiding the drawdowns. And that's the uh, the key focus is how do we avoid capital loss um, at times of crisis? We've grown to uh, around $30 billion in assets under management, offices in London, Edinburgh, Paris, and New York. Um, and we are 70% institutional, 30% uh, private clients, and excited for the future. And you're still a private partnership, and I wonder what you think that offers you. That is one of the most important features uh, of the business. It allows us the ability to focus on the long term. Now, a lot of people say they do that, but to me, when you become a public company, you are forced to focus on the short term by by your shareholders. Now, that means if you're an asset manager, that AUM growth has to be your focus. That's what drives returns for shareholders on a short-term basis. By being a private partnership, um, you know my capital is at risk in the business. We are able to take long-term perspectives. Uh, we're able to make decisions that don't make sense up front. I think over the years that institutional component of the client base, which is now, as you said, sort of 70% has grown enormously. And I just wonder why that shift occurred. It um, occurred for the most part following the financial crisis. Um, and I think the reason for that is, well, the superficial reason is that the returns were pretty good. Uh, and I think institutional uh, asset owners began to think, right, we've suffered pretty extraordinary losses in our equity book, private equity book, debt book. What are, what are we doing wrong? Can these guys help? Um, the value of avoiding capital losses in compounding returns over time is extraordinary. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a mathematical force um, that has come to be recognized as an important component of uh, portfolio investment. And I think something that we offer is a wide variety of macro views. Um, you know, we, we have opinions on a lot of different asset classes because we are global, because we're macro, because we're unbenchmarked. Everything is of, of relevance to us, um, but we are independent. And so people value that uh, intellectual partnership as well. Right. Well, we're going to talk about the whole investment engine and and process, and and maybe that's a good place to 
to, to continue because in Ruffer's materials, there are a couple of things that stand out as you read them in terms of statements. Uh, Ruffer describes themselves as an alternative to alternatives. I think we should unpick that. Um, and the proposition is that Ruffer manages a global absolute return strategy unchanged since 94, which is unbenchmarked and multi-asset. Why don't we just start with the benchmark issue because it raises those you know, those very real issues about setting expectations and, and measuring results. I think um, it gives us a great advantage over all of our competition because most investors are, are forced to own something that they might not want to own. If you are um, benchmarked to an index, even if you think a component of the index is absolutely uh, doomed to fail, you end up having to own some of it, or at least taking very, very significant risk uh, yourself by by not owning it. We, we've uh, used historically the example of um, the credit crisis. You know, we did not own any banks, financial equities, anything like that in the run up to the credit crisis. Had you been benchmarked to the FTSE 100, you might have gone, you might have been fired, might have gone bust by the time that the crisis actually came around because of the outperformance of banks in the run-up to that event. Um, benchmarking has perverse incentives, we think, um, and this allows us total freedom to focus on our capital preservation uh, investment objective, which is the first thing that we're trying to do um, at any given time. Just thinking about, I'm a client, I'm debating which uh, investment manager I use. I understand the capital protection, but over time with GDP growth, equity markets should participate. So you have to be a risk taker as well. Therefore, how um, how do you explain to clients that there will inevitably be these periods where you are not, for whatever reason, able or willing to participate in, you know, in some of the rise in asset prices? So over our history, uh, we've delivered about a 9% uh, average annual return since since we started uh, over a quarter of a century ago. Um, that has been driven uh, by participating as fully as we think appropriate in, in bull markets and capital preservation through, through bear markets. If you see our returns dropping off relative to the market, that's typically an indicator that we are seeing you know, less attractive opportunities in the market. Um, less asymmetry and you know has historically been a, a reasonable um, early warning indicator that, that something uh, is on the horizon. What that adds up to, given that the cash rate has been about 3% over our history, is that cash plus five is, is a reasonable outturn for, for the portfolio. However, we don't, we don't target returns, we don't target a volatility level. Um, we're focused primarily on capital preservation, not going below zero. And you know, as, as our founder, Jonathan Ruffer says, we've got the advantage that we can take risk wherever we like, but we have got to take risk. Um, and it's by avoiding losses with risky assets that we're able to deliver returns. Right. So let's talk about the investment process or investment engine and just give me a, a sense of how it functions. So... We start from a blank sheet of paper, unbenchmarked, as you say. And what we're looking to do is put in place assets that will protect us, protect our clients' capital um, against the market environments that we see coming. And the one thing you can say with absolute certainty about the future is that it's not possible to predict it. However, if you break it down into two component parts, what's going to happen and when is it going to happen? It's our view that you can have a pretty good go at the what. What are the things that's going to happen? What do we need to worry about? It's almost impossible to add the second part and conclude clearly on the timing. So the investment process, the way we construct portfolios, is to say, what is the next market regime going to look like, next economic regime, next inflation regime? What are the right assets for that regime? to put them into the portfolio at that point and then think about well, what if we're wrong about that regime coming to pass? 
what if we're wrong about the timing of it? What assets will we need to to carry those protective assets to the time where they're needed? And you know, I think therein you've got the the core of what makes us different to the rest of the industry. Most people are focused on return maximization. You know, what are the best opportunities out there in the world? Let's put them into a portfolio. You know, the highest quality companies, the most attractive trades. Com- compile them all together, and then maybe, if you're lucky, you know, risk management as an afterthought. So rather than focus on return maximization, we focus on risk minimization. So risk management is is endogenous to the construction of our portfolios. What are the risks we're concerned about? Deal with those first. Put in place the assets that you think will be required to protect against those risks coming to pass, and then let the return take care of itself rather than the other way around. Okay, so let's dissect the organization because you have a research team, you have an asset allocation team, you know, you have portfolio managers who are absorbing and implementing that. So just for, for, for clarity's sake, explain how that works. Bring it to life a bit. So the asset allocation uh, is set by the asset allocation team that's led by Jonathan Ruffer, our founder and chairman, and Henry Maxey, our CIO. Uh, you know, they receive constant challenge and debate on on what the asset allocation team think that the the right portfolio setup is. But ultimately, we believe in a democracy of ideas, but an autocracy of decision making. You know, it's important to have a small number of decision makers at the very top level. It allows for agility, it allows for conviction. So once the asset allocation is set, and that's a, a, an iterative process, the research team are in charge of security selection, of fulfilling that asset allocation with the uh, best instruments and securities for the job. We think that gives us the opportunity to be right twice, to be right on the macro idea and to be right on the micro implementation of it. That then leaves you effectively with um, an asset allocation and instruments to populate it with, The job of forming that into a coherent portfolio falls to fund managers such as myself. Um, Our role, aside from input and debate at the asset allocation level, is to have oversight over the whole portfolio from the micro to the macro. Now, you uh, alluded earlier on to the the key metric for asset management firms is growth in assets alongside performance. And one of the inevitable consequences is asset management firms build out silos of products. Now, am I right in saying that if you sign up as a client of Ruffer, essentially you all have the same uh, ultimate portfolio? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, We are a single strategy firm. We have different vehicles for that strategy. Uh, They are designed to ensure that what you're investing in, in structure terms, is optimized or optimal for you as an investor, you know, are you located in Australia? Are you located in Europe, UK, US? Um, that is why there are different different vehicles, but the strategy in which you invest is the same. And staying with that idea of size and complexity, whilst you have not gone down the path of complexity, you've certainly grown a lot. And we all know that size can be the enemy of swift action. And I wonder how you think size has impacted your responsiveness. The short answer is it hasn't. So we measure, uh, well, we we have a full set of liquidity metrics that we look at to make sure that the portfolios are never constrained by size. How we think about it philosophically is, do we have to dilute the quality of the investments that we're using because of the size that we are? You know, we're not interested in uh, being liquid for liquidity's sake. As it happens, we think that it is an extremely important point in the cycle to remain, to, to have a liquid portfolio, which we can touch on later. But, you know, we, we don't see any constraints uh, from our current size whatsoever. Okay, so I'm clear on that as well. So that does allow us to talk about the change in the investment climate. And you have written about this as a firm um, 
you know, over the last year. So it's not new and we definitely have a new weather system, um, you know, in place. But I guess let's start with maybe summarizing why you believe this is more profound than a passing storm. So we've actually been writing about the changing weather since December 2008, when Jonathan Ruffer in his investment review at the time said that, you know, all around us is deflation, but this cycle will end in inflation. So we've certainly been preparing for inflation for a very long time. Uh, I think you'd have to be very charitable to say early <laughs> rather than wrong on that initial call. Um, what What's going on at the moment represents the single greatest threat to investor wealth that we are likely to see in our lifetimes. To go back to the, the quote at the beginning, um, you know, we, we don't think over the next cycle that it will be possible to deliver positive absolute returns from long only assets. Why is that? We come from, you know, the position we are starting from is an extraordinary one. In in search of a 2% CPI target at a time when the world was producing a great deal of disinflation uh, or, or even deflation, central banks have medicated asset prices higher, um, arguably since, since at least the mid-90s. That has led to an extraordinary uh, trend downwards in interest rates, uh, upwards in asset prices of absolutely anything you care to mention. Um, now, they've got a greater problem. Uh, they are in search of 2%, but from the other side, they need to push inflation down towards 2%. And put simply, that means they are beginning a process of unmedicating markets, of withdrawing the medicine. Now, that's not a linear process. But to us, it is a structural force. You know, rising inflation uh, is a structural force. Rising inflation volatility is a structural force. Both of those are going to make it very difficult for asset owners to preserve wealth. Yes, for those of us who have looked at in the inflation patterns of the 70s, I think there's no, there's a clear understanding that it moves in steps. And um, uh, there are periods when people begin to feel more optimistic. We may indeed find, you know, in the next 12 months that because of com comparables being you know, more favorable, people feel some relief. But come back to your key argument, which is this is structural, not cyclical. What are the most important implications for asset allocation? The most important implications for asset allocation are that as inflation rises, the compensation that investors demand ex ante for the risk of inflation goes up. Another way of saying that is that risk premia rise. What does that actually mean? It means asset prices have to become cheaper in order to entice investors into those assets. As inflation volatility rises, i.e. as uncertainty over the path of inflation, doesn't, doesn't have to be up, uh, could be down, rises as well, the, the number of expected outcomes in the market and, and in the economy also widens. What's the implication of that? Uh, the use of leverage has to come down. It gets more expensive uh, and the you know, the, the constraints on its use rise. Those two forces are both very detrimental to asset prices generally. Um, the 70s, you know, is a useful analog, but I think it's correct to say probably that we're still in the late 60s, uh, a period when inflation was visible, but not deemed to be the predominant concern. Uh, you know, we are still seeing so many um, historical signposts that the direction of inflation uh, is up. So let me unpack that a bit. The solution of most governments at the moment to problems in the economy 
is increasingly to use the government balance sheet to solve them. Coronavirus uh, and, and the lockdowns, very definitely a deflationary crisis. Government balance sheets used to solve the problem with, with the furlough payments, with stimulus checks. The energy crisis, very definitely an inflationary crisis, uh, a crisis of rising prices, has again been solved by governments using their balance sheets, either by handouts to consumers or caps on the level that energy prices are allowed to reach. That to us um, is a signal that inflation is still not the primary concern. The economy, employment and political popularity are the primary concerns and they favour more spending, not less. Using price controls is a technique for dealing with inflation that goes back at least 2,000 years, if not more. And every single time, it simply guarantees you get more inflation. Now, ultimately, inflation is always a process composed of episodes of inflation. You know, it looks a bit like the Loch Ness Monster, the journey from low inflation to high inflation, um, a, a sort of diagonal, a sloping upwards sine wave. We are probably at the apex of the current episode of inflation. So exactly as you say, it is entirely possible that in six, 12 months time, people are much more concerned about recession, uh, falling prices than uh, you know, the, what, what feels like at the moment an inexorable upswing in inflation. To us, that will be a head fake. Um, and it'll be one that'll probably be met by central bank easing by government spending to soften the recession, to prevent it from uh, causing economic damage or excessive economic damage. It's, it's that reaction function that guarantees we will head into another upswing. And that's, that's why I think the right analog is the late 60s, where exactly those dynamics were, were present. Um, there was not a popular mandate for dealing with inflation in hard terms, uh, i.e. You know, tightening until um, the economy really went into recession. And inflation never got back down to the level that it was before this all started. So are we going to see inflation fall from here? Yes. Are central banks responding to it? Yes. Is it going to go back down to 2% and stay there? Absolutely not. So let's talk about the assets that you deploy in that environment and also the I suppose the ability to recognize that they that, that that some of these assets are for rent rather than to own. Let's can we just talk about fixed income because one of the hallmarks of the portfolio as I looked at, at the beginning of the year was a large exposure to index linked um that were of course deemed to be the right place to be in a uh, in a rising inflationary environment. Um how have you thought about that because the landscape you know, proved to be very different, notwithstanding the inflation. Yes. Some of these instruments, the long-dated inflation-linked bonds have fallen by 75% since uh, October of last year, even as inflation has risen a very long way. You know, riddle me that. What has taken place is that interest rates have gone up a lot. Um, and the more sensitive your bond was to that, the, the more it's fallen. We came into 2022 with the duration of the portfolio, i.e. its sensitivity to interest rates at a negative level. So the portfolio was able to make money as interest rates rose. We have been selling that protection down all year uh, to a point where at the end of September, we felt this has gone far enough, this sell-off. We should be buying bonds here in quite some size. And we took the duration of the portfolio up to a peak of about eight years by the middle of October. Now, wh why do I mention all of this? Because we are in a bond bear market. Ultimately, the bubble in asset prices has been most extreme in bonds. Now, the closer an asset is to a bond, 
you know, if it's a bond like equity or an infrastructure asset or something that looks like a bond, the more overpriced it has become. You know, the opposite of a bond is um, something like a bank or a highly cyclical industrial company. N no surprise that those have been the worst performing equities on the whole over the last uh, 10 years as well. So, you know, the bond bear market will be characterized by higher highs and higher lows in interest rates. Hence, you know, fixed income is going to be a very difficult place to allocate structurally. And as a result, we, you know, began this market regime with negative duration in the portfolio, wanting to make money or to, you know, de deliver strong returns from interest rates going up. But we've pivoted that to being quite long of bonds in recent weeks. And when we talk about your equities, I've seen you've gone from uh, uh, as low as minus 15% net equity to zero, you know, recently. And you are talking about a generational liquidation of equities, which is part of the reason why you think it's going to be such a tough terrain for investors in long only to make to make money. But I sort of was thinking to myself, well, as a as a higher level statement, I'm sympathetic to that. But the valuation dispersion around the world is significant. Sitting here in the UK, that's been subject to very different forces from 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 those that have driven the US up. Uh, Asia has marched to its own tune to a very large extent as well. And within that, we have this enormous dispersion in valuation from at one point unloved oil companies that you know were largely very representative indices, which were now sort of, you know, although they rallied off their lows, uh, you know, are, are better, um, you know, represented to other sectors that, you know, that were what one might describe in the old fashioned sort of, you know, value terms. So um, I want to just probe a bit here because I think the statement that you've made, I understand, but I think it masks too many other issues. Yeah, sure. Uh, and equities are, for most people, the most interesting bit of asset allocation. Uh, they've had the highest returns historically. The, the problem is that the lesson that investors have learned over the last 30 years is that the optimal investment strategy is the 60-40 portfolio, 60% in equities, 40% in bonds. The best performing expression of that, particularly post-crisis, post-financial crisis, has been 60% US equities, 40% long treasuries. Why is that? Well, inflation's been low and stable and interest rates have been slowly trending down over time. So the longer your bonds, the better they have offset your equities in times of crisis. And from an equity perspective, what you wanted to own was companies where the volatility of their earnings was declining. So one of the most significant changes made by the mega cap tech companies over the last cycle was to move from buying Windows once every four years, from buying an iPhone once every two years, buying Adobe Acrobat once every five years, to a constant subscription pricing model, higher revenues from services, uh, more stable recurring revenues and earnings. So the volatility of their earnings came down a long way. In other words, they began to look a lot more like bonds. And so their valuations exploded. Uh, on top of that, they took advantage of the cheap financing available to them to buy back their own stock, uh, enhancing their earnings growth. In the value sectors of the equity market, by contrast, you know, which are typically stocks sensitive to GDP. People often talk about them as having, you know, GDP plus two growth potential. Um, when inflation was two and real GDP was two, the nominal economy was growing at, at four. So the sort of 15, 20% earnings growth offered by the FANGs was absolutely fantastic by comparison. And a lot of the value sectors had strong competition from China and other places for the products they were producing. It was a bit of a perfect storm. Where are we today? Bonds are selling off. You know, it'll be a volatile journey, but it's a structural bear market, as I say. The equities that look like bonds have felt that force 
Um, hence, mega cap tech companies have, have derated. It's getting more expensive for them to do earnings buybacks. And the consistency of their revenues is now uh, a disadvantage rather than an advantage. The US, not, the US economy, uh, in nominal terms, was growing at 9% a year at the last measure. So a stock, you know, delivering GDP plus is suddenly delivering significantly higher revenue growth. And in an inflationary environment where they put through prices and they started with thin margins, their earnings growth is very significant. So we're seeing a significant rotation from growth to value that we think is likely to continue. What does that mean for investors? Bond bear market, avoid the 40 part of 6040. Interest rate sensitive stocks, as a result, most heavily affected. And they were the epicenter of the overvaluation in the first place. So in your 60, avoid the large cap tech companies. They're likely to be structural underperformers from here. Now, to go back to your question on asset allocation, we don't think 60 40, let me be more accurate. We don't think that passive fixed asset allocation is the way forwards from here. Uh, it was perfect for the, let's call it the 1995 to 2021 extended great moderation, uh, the zero interest rates era, uh, post financial crisis. What you need now is dynamic asset allocation. The strategies that worked best over the last 10 years are likely to be the ones that work worst over the next 10 years. And you have to be very careful of momentum, given that market forces are now in action. It's not central banks who run the show anymore, it's markets. That's a, a sea change. And you know, one of the best performing strategies this year has been trend following, you know, a very important component of most global macro strategies. They, on the whole, gave up half of their year-to-date returns in the period following the CPI report in the middle of October. You know, trend is a very important component of any asset allocation in an inflationary era. But if inflation is volatile, trends can reverse suddenly. And, you know, our structural view is that just as the period 1995 to 2021 was characterized by consistently rising asset prices punctuated by sharp crashes. So the reverse should be true of the next market regime. A consistent bear trend in asset prices punctuated by sudden rallies. That's why we don't think it will be possible or to soften that. It certainly won't be easy to deliver positive absolute returns from long only assets over this next cycle. Your timing will have to be impeccable. And to go back to how we construct portfolios, timing is the hardest part of investment. So I know that you have exposure to banks and you talked about the climate being much more favorable. Uh, and I understand that. But I also note you're decidedly negative on the asset management industry. So just uh, give us a little color on that. I have to be careful about what I say here. But, you know, people respond to incentives and uh, especially public asset managers. Again, the incentive is to grow AUM, which typically means you need to go to where the returns are highest. Post financial crisis, the returns on bonds went to zero or the yield on bonds went to zero. And that pushed everyone, investors and asset managers, up the uh, illiquidity curve and up the risk curve. So we've reached a state where, you know, after talking to investors in the US in April, the, the kind of the message that I received was my public equity managers are doing private equity. My private equity managers are doing VC and my VC managers are doing crypto. So significant mission creep from a lot of people. 
uh, significant liquidity creep <laughs> and significant risk creep. So where are we today? You have a lot of investors with a great deal of their portfolios in high risk, illiquid assets. Um, private equity has been one of the biggest beneficiaries of this cycle. The cost of leverage has been falling. Um, and you know the returns on cash have been falling. Private debt, seen as a, a safe haven, you know you you can get a treasuries plus return. Why wouldn't you want that plus? Uh, property is an interesting one. A huge amount of money has gone into it because it's seen as a an inflation protected asset. But what it responds more to is the level of interest rates and leverage. Um, so, you know, the, the asset management sector has probably got to shrink quite a long way. Um, the earliest signs of that are visible in public equity managers. Uh, that, that's where the repricing has been felt most, most obviously, um, and they've started to consolidate. Completely unfelt as yet in the private parts of the asset management sector, uh, let alone VC. and. You know, I, I think it, it's it's going to be difficult. What we can say is that by being unbenchmarked, we can avoid a lot of these traps. There is a huge amount of hidden leverage in the system, and I think that is likely to be the critical dynamic going forwards. So historically, Rafa have had and made important decisions around currency and gold, and. Um, I want to be just look at both of those. I understand right now that your gold weightings are very low. Uh, and so I'd like to just explore that, particularly since in, at least in the interim, you're suggesting that rates come down. And I'm not sure that I was able to reconcile those two positions. Um, so let's just start with gold. Yeah. Everyone secretly, I think, likes to be bullish of gold uh, because they see it as a hedge against the wheels coming off everything. And there's some kind of uh, sort of misty eyed vision where, you know, if only you had some gold sovereigns in your drawer, you'd be able to go and be the only person in the country able to buy bread from the supermarket. Gold represents a hedge against currency debasement. If you as a, as a person operate entirely on your own gold standard, i.e. hold all your assets in gold, you are immune to the government's attempts to take money off you by printing pounds or dollars. So it definitely has appeal. It is by far the longest lived uh, asset class and, and has very clear historical evidence showing that it does protect you against inflation uh, and hyperinflation over time. However, it's also a victim of its own success uh, as bonds became, in some instances, I, I would say ludicrously overvalued, um, moving to negative interest rate levels. The appeal of gold, which is kind of harder to value, rose. And so it began to creep into institutional and uh, retail portfolios. You know, To answer your question from earlier, because it's relevant here on a liquidation, gold could be caught up in that. So what do we mean by a liquidation? Um, you know, the, the, the idea that as the rate of return on deposit rises and asset prices do not cheapen, which is what you, one would expect them to do in response to that, because investors remain invested, you effectively increase the propensity for people to suddenly sell a lot of their assets after they see you know significant negative returns on their portfolio whether it's bonds or equities and head for the safety of what will quite soon be a five percent return on money in the bank um, or more accurately uh, money at the fed equities most likely to be caught up in that but gold definitely in there as well it's it's had a hard time this year uh, given the scale of interest rate rises, but not as hard a time as one would have expected. That's partly attributable to the war in the Ukraine, uh, 
uh, where I think the US's moves to um, immobilize assets owned by Russia have awakened people to the possibility of um, a move away from the dollar standard and therefore the, the importance of gold in, in central bank reserves. Uh, that premium is still in there, but we are warming to gold again. You know, it, it's an asset that we have a structural, uh, that has a structural place in our portfolio for sure. I'm not sure I'm misty-eyed about gold. I own quite a lot of it, have done for a, for a while. It's an important part of my allocation. And, and, and you say gold's had a tough year. Of course, it's only had a tough year in dollar terms. It's yeah. been a source of great performance in any other currency, um, which leads us right into that currency question, because in that 08 financial crisis, I remember Rafa had large exposures, at least temporarily, to the yen and maybe even the Swiss franc as a source of diversification and return. How are you thinking about currencies today? Currencies are back. You know, it's... Uh, it's very exciting, I think. Um, FX markets, FX vol have been the dead zone since about 2010, uh, excepting some uh, sort of sporadic excitements. Currencies were so boring because everyone had the same cycle. They had the same economic cycle. They had the same interest rate cycle. Um, the world was very uh, homogenous, globalized. Where are we today? The Bank of England was the first major central bank to hike December last year. And yet the Fed is now a percentage point ahead of them and set to rise further. The ECB was at minus half percent in July. Uh, the Bank of Japan st still going the other direction. Um, still at minus 0.1 on the deposit and still trying to cap yields at the 10-year tenor. So you've got huge central bank dispersion, central bank policy setting dispersion, let alone economic dispersion and asset price dispersion. How is that all uh, equilibrated by financial markets is through the currency markets, through currency volatility. Currencies are notoriously hard to call. Jonathan Ruffer often says, if you have a sudden view on a currency, you should go lie down in a dark room and <laughs> think about <laughs> oh it for a while God, before coming back. I must do that more often. <laughs> uh, we try to avoid using currencies for anything other than protective purposes, but there are definitely return opportunities in them. Uh, we have driven decent returns from our US dollar exposure this year. We are excited about the potential for the yen, where they appear to be going in firmly the other direction, despite global evidence that the interest rate and inflation cycle has turned. Now, they've got good reasons for doing that. They want to deliver an inflation defibrillation to Japan. And they you know, so far, so good. Uh, CPI is rising at a rate not seen in a very long time, hitting 3.7% uh, just last week. But, you know, as Dave Dredge said the other day, w what if it works? <laughs> what then? And to us, they are going to have to adjust the peg at some point. And that makes both a uh, short position in on JGBs and a long yen position uh, attractive. You could, at the moment, you know, the yen is appreciating because treasury yields are falling. So the yield differential between the two is compressing, the yen's going up. You can play it that way. If, and you know, we really mustn't rule this out, if the US economy turns out to be much stronger than everyone expects and yields and the dollar push back up again, then the pressure on the yen, the pressure on that cap builds back. And if they let the cap go, that is likely to be in the short term, at least, a, a significant VAR shock for bonds globally. And that's, you know, given that we have a duration position in the portfolio, that's something where we think the, the hedge, the, the offset from an appreciating yen and rising Japanese rates would be very helpful. So as I sort of draw this together, I mean, it's clear that this is an investment approach that has 
quite a few similarities with what one knows as the hedge fund universe. You don't have a hedge fund fee structure. Um, but just explain wh who are the types of clients who you think are most suited to this approach? Well, we would obviously argue that it's suitable for everyone. I think we have historically been very suitable for permanent capital. Uh, clients who are more focused on capital preservation and real returns than shooting the lights out. But what, what I think is, is interesting is that we often share similar macro views, uh, similar asset class, asset price views as some of you know, the, the top end global macro hedge funds. But whilst they're trying to hit three trades really hard and really right through the year, we are trying to avoid being wrong. We're trying to construct a portfolio that can contain elements of those trades, but that has assets on the other side if they don't work or if things go the other way. That means that we don't get caught up in momentum. We don't get caught up in overcrowded trades. We're always focused on the downside, always focused on capital preservation. And what you end up with there is a portfolio that is a little bit like a hard currency, uh, but one with exposure to risk so that it can deliver better returns uh, than just um, a hard currency deposit. In the coming cycle of rising volatile inflation, a structurally different market regime to the pre-COVID era. We think that's a pretty attractive proposition for, for anyone. So just before we leave the sector question, um, we've talked about what sits under the value umbrella. Clearly, energy has stood out. It started to be re-rated. Um, we all know the big picture about energy transitions, but the government's aspirations probably will have to confront realities. How are you thinking about energy weights? So energy represents around a quarter of our equity book and, and has done for about two years now. To us, energy is the fundamental. The cost of energy represents the primary constraint on the ability of economies to grow. And as a result, is a critical component of inflation, inflation expectations. Cheap energy allows for strong economic growth without inflation. What we had through the 2010s was a structural underinvestment in energy supply and a great deal of uh, asset price growth without much economic output underneath it. As that bubble is drawn down, as people sell their high value assets to spend it in the real economy, oil is the, uh, or energy is the constraint on them doing so. Uh, it's where the rubber meets the road. So to us, it is um, a true real asset. And it is helpful that energy equities are typically very good value as well. So what you get to own is a real asset with real operating business on the top at an attractive valuation. And to us, that's a, a winning combo. So, Matt, that's been very helpful in uh, being able to encapsulate Ruffer's philosophy and its approach, um, your expectations, um, and clearly your view of a very uh, more challenging time ahead. Um, a couple of things that I'm just going to summarize with. One, in terms of your process, I just will quote back to you, and I think that is you know, important that you believe in democracy of ideas, but autocracy of decision making, and that the climate which we find ourselves in and which you have articulated, the solution isn't a passive asset allocation solution, but something that is much more dynamic um, and much more flexible than, uh, the, than structures that have been in the work well for the last 20 years. So, Matt, it's been a great pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much. Great, Simon. Thanks very much for the conversation and looking forward to speaking again soon.